What's up, fellow gamers? Freak here. I'm the design lead of the Summoner's Rift team live pod here on League of Legends, and patch 14.8 is coming to a server near you or already live on a server near you. And anyway, this is the MSI patch as well, as you can see from the text down here. Um, is there any interesting preamble to say about this patch? Not really. Um, ultimately, what it comes down to is we tried to select a group of champions that we thought we could buff into the pro meta. Uh, as always, time is limited, resources for playtesting and everything else are limited, uh, QA resources are limited, design resources are limited, and so um, obviously in any individual patch we could theoretically change 160 champions. Um, if we had infinite people, we probably would because every champ has something that's like quality of life based or whatever that would be useful. Uh, time is limited. And so being that this is the MSI patch, uh, we went for champions we thought had a high reliability of having an impact in pro play itself, uh, which either means a few overperforming pro play champions or <clears throat> champs we thought that giving some small buffs to uh, would have a meaningful impact and actually move the needle in pro play. There's plenty of champions that probably are weak that we could buff that wouldn't see pro play regardless. And so we prioritized things that we thought uh, two things. One, still had some room in solo queue such that buffing them was not just going to make the game strictly worse while making pro more interesting. Like for example, we could have buffed Shaco by like 5% win rate and gotten Shaco at MSI. That would not have been correct for League of Legends. Uh, meanwhile, we buffed things that we knew pros would actually play and had put reps on the last year and a half such that they wouldn't have to learn a chant from scratch. Um, and so, yeah, we prioritized things that we thought pros would actually play. Again, our constraint was changes we thought would be reasonably good for League of Legends, though not the most important individual buffs for generic solo queue, granted. Uh, and the final point was also making these choices around putting some different types of champions into pro play. Like, we don't really need even more control mages in mid lane. We've already got a ton of those already. So we could have buffed Malzahar, and we probably could have buffed Lissandra, and we probably could have buffed Syndra, but they already only play control mages in mid, so we're not really getting any strategic depth there. Even though, in a regular patch, those would be very reasonable buffs to give League of Legends, in general. Okay, with that out of the way, that preamble out of the way, let's talk about the individual changes in patch 14.8. It is very, very, very buff heavy, as you can see. Uh, we expect for 14.9 to be nerf heavy. As a result, we know we are doing some power creep in this patch. Um, there are some nerfs. I think these nerfs are all very, very warranted. And again, a lot of the nerfs that we haven't seen yet will be coming in about two weeks' time, but that's not the point of this video. Alrighty, on to the champion changes. Uh, first up, a very simple buff to Akali. It is 30 base health. Uh... Technically, the math is here. It's not terribly useful, but flashbang warning. That was really bright. Uh, yeah, so here is Akali's health before and after. Uh, this is accounting for her default Doran shield start, or Doran's wing, I forget, whatever. Uh, whichever one is most common, I didn't. I just put the number in. Uh, and then also her most typical stat shards pick, which is uh, the scaling health rune. So here's how much Akali has before and after. It is an early game focused buff. Pro tends to care a lot about early game, and so Akali is getting some more early game. Uh, we don't think she needs a ton of extra power in solo queue. She can stomach some, it's fine, but yeah, we're giving Akali some lane resilience so that she can try to bully people out in pro play because pros are good at bullying people out um, of lane. Azir is getting a somewhat well-deserved nerf. Uh, it's not that Azir's win rates are extreme really anywhere in solo queue. Uh, even in relatively high MR brackets, Azir is fine i guess but is the clear number one mid laner and has been for a very very long time uh we dragged her heels in this for a bit largely because i think azir does uh actually create meaningful cool things in pro play also by having viable late game carries in mid lane you don't have to play strong late game carries in bot lane and thus you actually get uh, a solid amount of uh like class variety in bot lane when we know that pro teams are usually very good at playing around an individual AD carry and just playing feed the Zeri. Uh, so I think there are a lot of sort of meta game reasons that Azir uh, can be allowed to be a little bit stale. Uh, that said, he shouldn't be number one all year long. And so we're bringing him down a peg, um, largely trying to bring down the fact that Azir's landing phase is still too unassailable for how good his late game is. Now, I think we got some meaningful gains in there uh, back in the 
13.4 or 5 or whatever update where we made him max W instead. We we basically made sure that Azir is not a bully in lane if you're good at him. Uh, now Azir can withstand lanes somewhat if you're good at him and is otherwise, you know, he's not going to get priority, right? He tends to be down CS, he tends to be down push, but he doesn't tend to die because Azir is honestly a pretty safe champion, right? You can He can hold E literally forever and use it to get out. Yeah, it's, it's not that hard. He has okay gank follow-up. Anyway, whatever. The point is, uh, we are basically doing some changes here that intend to further open up early game lane weaknesses of Azir. And so it is a, another hit on his base health regen. We nerfed health regen by two a few packs ago, and that was about two-thirds of 1% of win rate. So this will be around half a percent of win rate, which we know has an impact because it can't not, right? Enemy players are good at harassing in lane. So any aggressive laner should theoretically be better into his ear as he's going to have to go take his recall sooner and whatnot, right? And the second side of it is taking 0 to 8 base damage off the W. Now, um, you someone might say XD is only 8 damage, but like... W is the primary damage tool of Azir, and neither the base damage or the ratio are all that high, such that 8 damage actually does matter even in late game. Now, not an absolute ton. We're not trying to turn Azir into a garbage champion that no one could play in any skill rank, because right now he's only, like, really even a champion you would consider good in, like, Masters Plus, and then obviously Pro Play is the best champion in the game. So we're not trying to brick his win rate. We're trying to make sure that in Pro Play, they're like, oh, yeah, there are lane counters, and if this means we can give Azir a better late game or better something else down the line, that's awesome, because as long as pros feel like they can counter Azir by playing well, then we free up space to not be pro-jailed, right? So uh, here is the health regen for Azir. Um, here's how much health per minute he gets before and after. This is, of course, not counting things like fleet footwork um, or grass, which is not always run, but is frequently run. Um, here is this using uh, four minutes health regen plus his like functional base health and the Doran's ring and the parts of land he eventually builds as like, here's kind of how much health overall he has as a champion. And obviously the percentage is a lot smaller when you have a you know fat health pool to back yourself up on. Uh, but here's the math on the W damage of Azir, and this is actually, again, I think a pretty meaningful thing when you consider, like, this is the only place he has damage from. Um, and so, you know, the, the you know functional only damage tool on Azir is down about 3%. That is a meaningful deal. If this is the only place he dealt damage, like, literally at all, this would be about 1.5% win rate. Now, that's obviously not true. Now, just Tooth exists. Uh, Q does some damage. E does some damage. R does some damage. Well, it's not quite 1% win rate, actually, but... I wouldn't be surprised if this is like a solid 1% win rate, and we know this would be about 0.5% win rate, and so, yeah, I expect to see some movement on Azir's win rate, and hopefully disproportionately, uh, some movement in Azir's presence in pro play. Uh, Briar is an absolute low MMR stomper. She has a very, very steep mastery curve still as far as we can measure. Uh, there's still going to be biases with just strictly measuring mastery curve, because um, measuring the last year of Briar counts you know, people are still to some degree learning the proper Briar builds, right? No one has like long-term institutional knowledge of how Briar is played. When you compare to Yasuo, who's, I don't know, 10 years old or something, and it's like every champion, every player has institutional knowledge of what Yasuo plays like and what his strengths tend to look like and what things tend to look like and the kinds of things you can do. You just you just will learn champions some over osmosis over time. And so uh, with those biases in mind, Briar is like top five champs of the game of Mastery Curve. That's probably not actually true when this is true like farther and farther down the line. Uh, regardless, she is extremely, extremely dominant in high MMR, sorry, sorry, low MMR, and then debatably weak in higher levels of play, you know, like Diamond Plus roughly. Um, so this is once again a uh, two directional change here. Uh, one is some strict nerfs, right? Health growth down by five, blood frenzy attack speed down by up to 15. Uh, and then, hey, here's a bi-directional change of technically your first jungle clear is slightly faster with the 1% attack speed. Who cares? Uh, but the extra 25 range on Q to give her more mobility, the ability to dash to wards and teammates and whatever and try to uh, outplay and do interesting things and, and so trying to move this up. Now this of course further raises her skill cap indeed but uh, I think still a valuable thing to say hey you know we're trying to bring up the elite end where she's clearly underperforming and also bring down the the low MR end where she's clearly overperforming. I think those are always directionally solid changes and so that's happening here with Briar. We can do a little bit of math which is uh, now without actually counting for uh, builds in any way. Uh, here is what having five less health growth means. This will usually be a little bit under 1% win rate uh, but in terms of actual attack speed like if you're going to go for builds like Eclipse Sundered Sky and you're not going to build any attack speed at all and this is actually a fairly normal build uh, which is yeah your auto attack DPS during W is very quickly down like 
five to six percent. Um, that's a very, very big deal. If this was on all the time and all ships was auto attack, this would be a solid like three percent win rate, which is a lot. Um, of note, some random data points Briar's uh, auto attack damage share is low MMR skewed basically meaning that low MMR players are worse at kiting or peeling off Briar when she's autoing, typically during W. Um, so have an expectation that this is going to be a more meaningful low MMR nerf than high MMR nerf. Uh, similarly, level scaling is always reliably a low MMR nerf more than a high MMR nerf. That's just kind of true as well. And then again, the, the ward hop distance. Now, I don't expect her master's win rate to go up by any means. That's almost impossible. But we're swinging pretty hard here in terms of actually taking a low win rate off of Briar. She's been very, very high win rate for a while. And so this is bringing her down to hopefully a fairly reasonable level. Uh, we are giving some early lane phase buffs to Draven. Uh, again, I really think Draven can stomach this win rate. Uh, as a, I guess I'm a support player. I play in bot lane. I don't really play Draven. Uh, I've never been a champ. I've known how to play. Um, this champ can deserve buffs in high elo. Uh, Draven is like only like 51% win rate or like 50.5% win rate in like D1 plus in top 1%. And that's the only skill bracket where his win rate's over 50. Now this champ's weak. If he's only kind of good for 1% of players, champ's kind of bad. Um, so Draven deserves buffs. He is one of the harder to play AD carries in League of Legends. Uh, so you would expect to see relatively low win rates in Lord of Marsh when players are less practiced than their opponents uh, or, you know, lower down the mastery curve than, than the champions they're facing. You're going to see Lord of Mars. Uh, any kind of early game lane bully type champion is going to be the same boat as well. So anyway, we think playing up Draven's power as an early game lane bully is a good thing. Again, acknowledging it's the MSI patch, we expect to have some impact in pro play. We know there are pro players who play Draven. Okay, great. We get some more variants in the pro uh, scene. And again, if Draven was already 52.5% win rate in Diamond Plus, we wouldn't buff Draven. Um, if he was 52 in Diamond Plus, still not seeing pro play, we'd be like, well, that's too bad. They should really play Draven more often and then, you know, be sad about it and move on. But the champ actually has win rate room in solo queue. We know the EUS ban rate on Draven is like 60% or something. Okay, that's just one server among many. His overall elite ban rate is like 25%. It's like, yeah, whatever. Like, this guy has room. We know he's going to eat ban rates. He's a lane bully. AD carries ban lane bullies. So does people of every lane. This is how it works. Uh, there's no real math here. It's plus five damage per hit on Q. There's not much to say here. Um, we used this lever a little while ago. It was about 1% win rate. So we expect to give him about 1% win rate. Uh, Galio also not doing any acceptable math here, but just giving him some power because Galio, we think, can stomach a above average win rate uh, in terms of trying to make sure that there's um, a lot of variance in League of Legends. I think a pretty valuable uh, trait of the game is that uh, no two games play out the same way, and part of that is having variety in champion select. Um, there aren't a lot of like viable tanks in mid lane that people are okay actually seeing in their lane. Like if we had a Nautilus or Malphite mid meta, people would be pretty sad. And for good reasons, that just feels like their mid lane's getting invaded by champs who don't belong there. Uh, but Galio does feel like he belongs here, right? And so in terms of having a, a wealth of experiences, having the occasional tank asterisk here for Galio is like, oh, it's interesting. Now, to be fair, Galio's actual builds are um, AP Bruiser-esque and whatnot. I forget what he's building exactly right now. I still haven't checked because I haven't haven't kept up with it. Um, but I know he's moving more towards Roa and more towards Cosmic and more towards that kind of stuff. And he runs Aftershock very commonly as his rune of choice. And it's like, that's one of the tankiest mid lanes you could ever possibly have. His band runs Aftershock. Like, yeah, guess what? Um, and so moving in that direction is good. And having a champion who can build this way is interesting and unique and creates a variety of experiences. And there's some people out there who get hard counter by Galio. And sorry. Uh, and there's some champs who just feast on Galio. Great. There's a variety of experiences out there. You get another matchup that's really cool. Neat. Um, ultimately, five move speed. I will reiterate that 340 is functionally the base move speed of a melee champion. You can go down to 325. Nautilus and Alistair do this. You can go higher. Um, Olaf's at 350. Master Yi's at 355. Uh, that's fine. You can have room for variation here, but 340 is the default melee champion move speed. Galia feels like his kit should be default melee champion move speed, so here you go. Um, Winds of War cooldown. This will slightly, I guess, disproportionately buff support because support uh, leaves Q as a one-point wonder. Okay, whatever. Uh, regardless, this gives Galio some early lane prior, which is cool. Um, it gives him lower cooldowns to use to reset his passive. Plays up the playstyle, plays up the repeatability that we're kind of going for with Galio overall as a champion. Pretty good stuff overall, just trying to give him something. Um, so yeah, 
playing up some combat variants, playing up some champion variants, and seeing that Galio can be on the strong side. Like, you could, theoretically, if you want to, like, draw a really thin line so that you can say that technically Galio's overpowered now. Um, but, like, we think it'll be at, like, 51.2, and that's probably fine. We move on to Graves. Um... Yeah, trying to... So, Graves is really... From the inception of this rework, had always sort of meant to be melee-esque in the way that Urgot is ranged, but he's really a juggernaut. Um, Graves is not meant to be a juggernaut, to be clear, but he's meant to be pretty melee-esque. Um, even the fact that when you get crit chance on Graves, the actual pellets go wider, saying that if you're building crit Graves, find a way to get the melee range to do maximum damage. Um, and the, the more Graves is about playing the Lethality Burst Champion, I think the worse... Graves is as a champion. Uh, I think him wanting to get up in your face and having the tools to occasionally do that uh, while still being somewhat burstable and, you know, he's ranged. He has the the you know option of playing back and playing it forward in something range, which, you know, Renekton doesn't, right? Other than, you know, Flash Wing or something. Uh, so playing up the melee aspects a little bit and additionally playing up the crit aspects because then you get to incur a champion with more variance and more riskier. Now, to be fair, Graves is already a pretty high variance champion in the fact that his skill shots can miss in the fact that he's mostly a gold scaler, so a 0-8 Graves is very useless, and an 8-no Graves can kind of solo carry, uh, but the more he has to rely on auto-attacking, the longer he has to remain in range. Like, if Graves moves his builds to full crit auto-attack, he has to play longer duration fights as a squishier champion, which means that he can be bursted out if he misplays, which creates combat variants, right? He, he doesn't just one-shot you from Frog or whatever, and so uh, I'm pretty confident that the actual gameplay impact of this champion is much better if he is playing... Um, uh, more toward crit. So uh, basically saying here, here's an attack speed scaling lever. It's going to have attack speed uh, load into your reloads more quickly. Uh, that's going to be nice. And then also the uh, basic crit damage ratio when you crit, um, how this goes through. It's basically, um, it's basically a multiplier. This number is multiplied by your crit damage over 100%. So, you know, 75 baseline and 225 you have IE. Uh, and then that gets factored into how much more damage your pellets deal. Um, basically, I have a little bit of math here. Wow, that was a really long flashbang. Um, so basically, this is, if you just buy generic crit chance, um, instead of your pellets doing 30% more damage, they're going to do 33.75% more damage. If you buy an IE, you go from 50% more damage per pellet to 56.25% more damage per pellet, which really means if you have a crit, this is this is um, not I, I believe this is not IE, I don't remember. Um, but basically, um, critting goes from doing 73% more damage to doing 78% more damage when you land all, uh, all six pellets. Um, because, right, critting adds two more pellets, so, like, running in all that math and doing all the math together, uh, basically, Graves technically had a sub-normal crit damage ratio. It was functionally 73%, and you could miss two of the pellets, and now he has a better than 75%, um, you know, base crit damage functionally, um, but, of course, you can still miss some of the pellets to not get that, that full... Uh, sort of bit of math there. So I think this is probably more correct. Uh, maybe even something a little bit higher, like 82 or something, because you're more likely to miss pellets on crit graves because the V cone is wider. Um, that's says you also like hit other champions and, and maybe it's closer, but regardless, um, this looks like a much more reasonable crit damage, you know, functional ratio. His functional crit ratio is that. And so a bunch of math and that's great. It's doing much more damage if you build crit. Quay, uh, I know when this was talked about in the patch preview, I mentioned that we were buffing his QQ as well. Um, the story goes that the way Huey is uh, built under the hood, uh, his tooltips are in a different place than his functional spells. Um, this was done intentionally by the designer. I talked to him about it. Um, my opinion was that it should all be in the same place. Um, whatever, it doesn't really matter here. This is not about, like, a fight. It wasn't even a fight in the first place. But, like, regardless... Um, Due to human error, um, the tooltip version of QQ was updated and the actual damage version of QQ was not. Um, we failed to catch that both locally and through QA. Um, and so we got to, I think, Friday or something of last week. And uh, we could have built in a micro patch because I think TFT was already building a micro patch and. Um, I, I, or someone else was building a micro patch. I don't remember exactly. But like we could have pretty trivially. Um, rode the micro patch and added the QQ um, ability power ratio. Uh, and it wouldn't have really been an expensive situation to do. We were already in a micro patch. It was already going to happen. It wasn't going to be a big deal. Um, but this was the one buff this patch where I'm like, you know, I really wish we didn't really buff Way. I don't really think he needs it. Um, like we could buff him and it would give some movement and probes a little bit more Huey and probably be kind of cool. But like, I really don't think like 47 or 48% win rate Huey is actually a weak champion. And oh, this is the one case where I'm like, I actually think we might be doing a disservice to the game by buffing this champion. And then I heard that, ooh, we didn't actually buff the QQ damage. I'm like, yo, let's just not. 
let's just not micro patch this. Um, like the tooltip would be bugged. I'm pretty sure it's tooltip would be bugged, and it'll, and it'll have a higher AP ratio on QQ this patch uh, because we didn't like micro patch out the tooltip change. Um, I'm not 100% on that one, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, but regardless, it's like oh, we can just only ship the passive, which is a very very small amount of, uh, which is a very very small amount of power. Yo, please, can we? And and so I was like, hey, I would like if we did this. Um, people said okay, and so we, you know mistakenly but then intentionally didn't ship qq damage here uh regardless there's not much to talk about with the numbers here um but it's it's a little bit more damage onto the passive i think the passive was quite cool uh the by the way the reason that the qq and passive were targeted was basically his champion designer being like hey um here are the parts of way that from what i can tell looks to be underperforming based on what he saw from what players were using and his expectation of how common each ability should be and like hey if you have an expert there who's like spent a year building the champion and has really strong opinions on what the flow of each ability should be and usage rates and he's like hey based on what i'm seeing the passive looks limp and qq is not being used like the right share it's like you're the expert like of course and then it's understanding how much win rate budget we have to do that thing right to do the thing that's correct for the champion in the mind of the champion designer um with also the win rate budget making the best game we can right and like merging those two things together um and so Though I'm fully willing to accept that QQ should be stronger and then something else should probably go down uh, as compensation. Uh, again, Hoi doesn't really, I think, have the win rate room. Um, and so basically just pulling back and saying, well, you can get the passive change. It's not going to be too much power. We're willing to give this one out, but otherwise let's just kind of, let's kind of back off here. Jarvan, very simple change. I think it's about 1% win rate worth, 1% current health damage on the passive bonk. How much to say? The viable fighter jungler. Jin is getting several more fours, which is always happy for Jin players, but ultimately uh, Jin is another champion I think can, uh, somewhat like Galio, um, be, I guess you could call it intentionally overtuned if you want, um, but, you know, on, on the strong side here, you know, 51-ish percent win rate, like the sky is not falling, I don't think I would shove a champion at 53 just for variance sake, but it's like, you know, putting a champion maybe 1% above what they deserve because it creates other experience, I think is a defensible stance to have. Um, so again, Jin is pretty unique among AD carries, and um, I think tends to also be a fairly non-frustrating champion. Now, I don't completely believe that we should tune champions around frustration. I think we should, like, if we can make an equally fun champion who is less frustrating, I think that is worthy work to do, right? Um, but being like, actually, because you're frustrating, we're gonna like, we're gonna make you intentionally weak so that other players are less sad and you're gonna have less fun too. Um, I don't think that's generally speaking a reasonable stance unless the, the disparity is so large. It's like old Tom Kench with the highest band at the game and was like completely horrible, but we don't really have champs like that right now. Um, you could, I guess, argue Yumi is this, Yumi is sort of intentionally weak, but she's serving her purpose as a very good onboarding champion. I'm gonna keep bringing up Yumi because she's clear outlier here. Uh, Yumi is a champion whose win rate is intentionally lower than what would be probably appropriate for her if we only cared about every champ is equally balanced. Um, Juno's champion is probably going to be on the strong side of win rate if he's, uh, you know, compared to what would be perfectly balanced. Um, and this is, this is again, driving up gameplay variation as a meaningful factor, giving us a little bit of wiggle room when we decide it's valuable as designers. Um, so this will put, again, Jin on the strong side, just to belabor the point. We're giving him some basic move speed on landing crits. This is, of course, if you land four shot, you get it there. Otherwise, if you want to build crit chance itself, which, to be fair, his most common exact four item build is for crit slots, but he has a lot of builds that are also lethality focused. Uh, so, of course, both things exist, but hey, the fact that um, this is basically a crit scaler, right? The more you crit, the more this fires, um, means that... Uh, he is going to build crit chance more often. And because he's going to build crit chance more often, he's going to build attack speed more often. And so it's going to help move, help move him toward the crit purchases and away from lethality purchases, which I think in general, um, the more we can bribe non-assassins to not build lethality, I think the better combat pacing is overall. Uh, I don't personally believe that lethality items are incredibly overtuned. The virtue of the fact that most of our lethality champions haven't really changed win rate from way back when to now, which makes me believe that the relative power of an ecosystem is pretty much fine. There might be individual outliers. Profane Hydra might be one of them. Um, Yomu's for a bit, at least on range champions, was one of them. But otherwise, these items seem fairly reasonable to where they were before. And again, assassins should be building lethality. And not assassins should, I think, be able to do it occasionally when the mood strikes them. But putting Jin's default build toward crit, I think, is better for combat pacing. He's going to one-shot squishies um, less often and be used against tanks less often, which, not that Jin's going to be good against tanks, but closing the gap a little bit, in general, I think is fine. Again, getting non-assassins off lethality, I think is a little bit good for League of Legends on average. Exceptions, of course, can totally exist. Uh, 
Anyway, so this incentivizes crit, which then is done as attack speed, which incentivizes not building lethality. Okay, great. Um, we can do some math there in a second. I'll do it in a little bit. And then otherwise, it is uh, minus one flat damage on Q. Uh, the reasons should be obvious. This actually came from a Reddit comment a while back. I remember when I... Uh, implemented the Jin R buffs way back when and also made them end in four. Um, someone else, I remember the Reddit thread of like, here's the PBE preview or whatever. And it's like, here's the damage numbers. And was like, hey, but like, could you guys nerf Q by one? And then when a designer was like, hey, I want to buff this 80 ratio on Q. I was like, yo, listen, can you please, while you're here, nerf the base damage by one? There's not a better time to do this. Like, I don't think it's worth having Jin in the patch notes to say, dance a grenade, minus one damage as a line. I think that is a waste of space and everyone's time. I say this as me doing this video, um, but it's like, we're literally already changing Q and we're literally already changing Q damage, which means we get this text literally for free. It always has to be here. This text will always be here. So we can just add the minus one and we're not wasting space and wasting everyone's time. If we're going to do it, we should do it now, please. And he's like, okay, that's persuasive. Um, <laughs> so I like, I like elbowed my way in to be like, yo man, nerf this Q damage by one. Um, okay, let's do the math here. It's flashbang warning. Not too bad. Um, okay, so here is how fast Jin runs on um, his individually most built build is just the four stack of crit of Stormraiser, um, i.e. RFC LDR, which is not a lot of bonus attack speed, so he doesn't get this much um, extra here. I believe this math is correct, by the way, in terms of how much um, bonus AS is giving. And so the plus 4% is like, actually, yeah, you know, the value of the buff is still up like a solid 35 or so percent. It's a pretty big deal, which means your willingness to build crit is up, again, 30% or so, right? You know, the value of that buff is a lot higher. And even though we nerfed the base damage by one, obviously Q is doing more and more damage. Um, it is a bit of a U-shaped damage, so it's the early landing phase is quite a bit nicer. And then also his very late game is quite a bit nicer. So um, Jin's actual power curve is already a little bit U-shaped. He's a pretty good laner. And then um, very late game, he just starts to be so kitey and so high damage that he can just four shot almost any champ not named Orin or Malphite. Um, but like in the middle there at like two to three items, like Zeri and Jinx are kind of his better champions, um, which is totally reasonable. That's fine. I, and I don't think it's like his ultra late game is like, you know, remotely Zeri or Twitch tier or whatever. Uh, but like this power curve is kind of U-shaped and I think that's kind of interesting. It's not like a problem by any means. It's just like, I want to note that this is true um, and that the buff to Q ends up also being this, which is just a neat fact of reality. Uh, regardless, buffs to Jin. Uh, Kaisa, um, we are buffing in a way that is uh, somewhat assassin skewed. So again, I mentioned novel experiences. It's actually one thing I want us to uh, try to do more of going forward and is now just like one of the lenses I look at the game through um, is, is yeah, how novel are these champions? And Kaisa is uniquely uh, an assassin AD carry. Uh, like last time we buffed her, I suggested to the designer who buffed Kaisa, like, hey, what about our range? Like so that she can more reliably join her team be an assassin. He's like, cool, that sounds fun. We'll do that. Um, and then in this case, uh, a designer was like, hey, what do you think we should do on Kaisa? And I was like, oh, I actually really think um, bonus AD ratio on Q or like some kind of Q buff. I might've said bonus AD ratio. I don't remember if I said bonus AD ratio, but I mentioned Q and it's like, hey, playing at Kaisa as uniquely an assassin would be really cool. And I think maybe he and came up with AD ratio as the reason here. Like this could have been potentially number of missiles on Evolve Q or something, right? Like there's a lot of things this could have been. Um, regardless saying, yeah, uh, your ability to scale up as a bit more of an assassin. And this does mean that we're playing up the value of Collector Kaisa and, you know, or Eclipse Man Immune Kaisa, which I know is like one of the builds that she goes for. And it's like, okay, neat. Kaisa, the, the burst assassin, is, is a pretty unique play style um, and one that she should be willing to adopt and accept because that is absolutely the gameplay pattern of what R and Q are supposed to do. It being good and not a trap to play that way seems good to me. Um, there can be a number that goes too high, of course. I don't think we're there yet, uh, but it's a light buff to Kaisa because, again, her she is um, fairly average, last I checked, in terms of uh, like required mastery curve in terms of how hard she is to play as an ADC. Like she has some reflex tests and she has some interesting like awareness tests and whatnot. Like she's not as simple as like MF or Ash or something, uh, but she's also, you know, not Draven Callista tier, right? Uh, so she's like fairly average for an ADC. Okay, fine, whatever. Just like a note to be stated. Um, and uh, yeah, that means that all things being equal, her winner should probably be fairly close to 50. Uh, that said, Kaisa gets so popular when she's like, neutral to very good that she just like crushes ad carry pick rate uh and actually creates really negative novelty which um i mean ultimately means that yeah we kind of if you want to call it this way we sort of punish people for being popular um but again i think novelty is actually a pretty valuable thing and so um you know kaisa though is allowed to have a reasonably high pick rate is allowed to be you know have a reasonably good you know solo key win rate uh is allowed to have some pro presence and again as far as individual sort of uh stylistic stuff she's being played up as an assassin 
pseudo assassin, whatever, right? Uh, moving on to LeBlanc. Uh, LeBlanc has been pretty bad for a while. Uh, we still, I don't think, have fully recovered from... Uh, I, I forget the old inflection point, but really before, like, full AD LeBlanc really took off and we took a bunch of nerfs in her to nerf AD LeBlanc. But I think since that point in time, we finally got to the point where, like, Luden's first item is a solid, like, 4% higher win rate than Static Shiv's first item. And the thing is, we have to, like, actually preserve this, like, 3 to 4% win rate. Delta. Otherwise, people think they should play AD LeBlanc again. And the gameplay of that just really sucks. Um, now, the nice thing is, you know, a lot of LeBlanc's stats are pretty normal for a mage at this point. Like, I, I think she might still have the bad AS ratio. Uh, that said, if you don't put attack speed, it doesn't matter because all the outputs are the same in terms of her, like, functional attacks per second when hitting. Her actual attack damage as a champion is similar to other uh, mages. I think it's, like, pegged pretty close to where Ari is, for example. Um, but anyway... We did enough of shifting towards uh, your AS ratio is bad, your base AD is bad, aka Triforce is bad, uh, and your AP ratios are good, such that we have space to do things like cooldown changes or base damage changes without immediately bringing back AD LeBlanc. Though, unfortunately, that will always be intention because I, I really do believe the gameplay of AD LeBlanc is very bad. Um, so, uh, yeah, five flat damage on Q, of course, early game skewed. Uh, three seconds off uh, rank one distortion cooldown is, of course, early game skewed as well. We do the numbers real quick on what this means. Uh, here is LeBlanc's Q damage uh, before and after. This is accounting for pretty normal ability power purchases. Again, pretty early game skewed. But your level nine is only 3% more damage, and then it goes down. To be clear, this is only one half of the Q hit. The other half is going to do this much damage again. Uh, and then the W cooldown, again, just doesn't matter after level nine. But uh, meaningful early game power to LeBlanc. Uh, yeah, we would love to see LeBlanc back in pro play. Basically, this is a champion who has perennially been pro jailed. And we would like her... I, I mean, she's not even in pro play, so she's just bad, right? Like, this champ has a low win rate, and she's not good in pro. Which means this champ is just weak. Um, and so, I know one of the, like... I don't know, meme ish comments I saw was like, ah, it must be MSI, time for LeBlanc. But like, LeBlanc is actually just bad. And this is what I talked about in the preamble, where it's like, we tried to find champions that we thought would get some pro pickup, but also just like actually could use buffs. Graves is one of these, Draven's one of these, Jin's one of these, LeBlanc's one of these, Galley's one of these. Like, yeah, all these we think could see some pro play. Maybe not so much crit Graves, but okay. Um, but yeah, like, LeBlanc is just actually bad. We should just buff her, and so we are. Uh, so here's the spiciest change of the patch, which is tweaks to Mordekaiser. Um, 10 damage off E is the only nerf. We are buffing Obliterate by one second cooldown at ranks 1 through 4, uh, which I think these will be relatively neutral. Um, I don't want to say relatively neutral. I think in high MMR, this will be more of a buff than it is a nerf. I think in lower MMR, it's going to be much, much closer. Like, if you're if you're like, oh man, these, these gold Mordekaiser players are killing me, they're not going to use this cooldown change very well, and they are landing these E's pretty often. Um... E as a function of Mordekaiser's damage is disproportionately low MMR skewed. We could go lower. Like, if he gets way too much win rate, this can go 60 to 120. This can go 60 to, I don't know, whatever, something else. Um, 60 to 100 if it really had to. It just has, like, no damage rank up. It feels kind of bad, but, like, we could if we had to. Um, the AP ratio could go down, and it could be moved somewhere else because, again, E is disproportionately hit in low MMR play, right? Um... And then we could move it onto something else that high MR players are better at using, like auto attacks and stuff, right? We can move we can move the attack the auto attack AP ratio up or something, right? And reward him for being able to stick or something. I don't know. I'm just like feeling down the line. Like we can do other things to unskew him, right? Um, but he is skewed right now. He's quite significantly low elo skewed right now. And so some of this is just let's move some numbers around in very safe ways, very low scope ways that we know will have the impact we want of disproportionately buffing high MR compared to low MR. Okay, fine. That's not the spicy thing, of course. The spicy thing is uh, you can no longer escape the death realm through any means. Um, no longer do any cleanses or Quicksilver Sash or Mercurial Scimitar uh, break you out of death realm. If you are unstoppable, you will not go in. The thought process for this is changing dimensions is a crowd control effect. Once you're in there, it is no longer CC, you're just in the dimension. Uh, so if you want to perfectly time Warwick Q, you dodge it. If you want to already be in Olaf R, Mordekaiser cannot ult you. Um, if you are under the effects of Mal's passive, it won't work. If you're black shielded, it won't work. All those things are still true. Uh, but you can only be cleansed out of it by these abilities. Congratulations, Mordekaiser gets to feel a whole lot better about his gangplank matchup. And maybe a whole lot better about his Olaf matchup. Keep in mind, Olaf can just pre-cast R. And if Olaf has reflexes, um, Mordekaiser R is, I think it's a 0.4 second cast time, I think. Um, it's long enough that if you're really paying attention and you're good, um, you can snap cast your Olaf R and block it. Uh, that's going to be there. You can spell shield, you can black shield. Like, all those things are still 
still there. It's 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 long enough that a really paying attention player can reflexively do this kind of stuff. Hecarim can R, etc., etc. All these things are true. Um, anyway, that's the big change here. This is giving Mordekaiser a much, 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 much more reliability. Uh, I don't expect this to be a huge win rate impact in terms of actual practice. Like, if Mordekaiser gains 3% win rate this patch, I will be truly shocked. Um, it is theoretically possible. I just don't expect it to happen. Um, unless it's like, oh, wow, the Olaf matchup just, like, the fact that his Olaf and GP matchup moved that much that he's that much better, like, that would be the one where I'm like, oh, okay, the fact that he can just guarantee he kills Melio or whatever is that much win rate. I just don't expect that to be really true. Um, it's usually going to be like, you know, 0.2% in, in the case of like averaging out the matchups and, and that going on. Anyway, um, yeah, I expect his ban rate to go up a ton. I expect people to be like, oh my gosh, this Mordekaiser, he's so... I, there's no there's no counterplay. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't care if a champion is frustrating. Not exactly. I care about the value the champion provides to the League of Legends. And if Mordekaiser players are happy in at least equal proportion to the amount that Mordekaiser's opponents are frustrated, they, there's no counterplay. That is fine. Um, that is fine. That is that is what I believe. That is that is the stance we are currently taking. Uh, that stance could change down the line. But um, just because a change is more frustrating does not matter as long as it also creates fun for the player. Um, again, the ratios matter. Uh, but that's ultimately the goal here. Like, if Mordekaiser players are like, my champ is awesome, but he's an 80% win rate, so I can't play Mordekaiser, or he has an 80% ban rate, so I can't play Mordekaiser anymore, then we're not serving Mordekaiser players, right? But anyway, let's move on. Uh, oh, we have math real quick, so we can do the math. Uh, so this is Mordekaiser's Q cooldown. Again, levels 1 through 9, it matters. But level 7, does a quarter second matter? Barely. Um, technically, yes, but, like, not really. And then the E damage is actually meaningfully down, because just 10 base damage actually kind of matters. Um, so not much to say with the numbers, but, like, the numbers are here. Uh, you know, once you're level 9 and onwards, champ like, Mordekaiser is just strictly weaker than before, other than the QSS interactions, which you weren't always against, right? You're laning against Ken in top lane, there was never a QSS interaction. It never mattered. That matchup doesn't change in any way, except that your early clear is better, and your late game all-in is always worse. Um, anyway, we'll see what happens. Olaf is getting a follow-up jungle buff. He's still a little bit on the weak side, um, 0 to 20 on the jungle monster mod. We think his first clear is already pretty good. Uh, his second clear onwards, though, uh, we just have room to give him more power in the jungle to turbo farm to be a strong jungler, and so here you go, buddy. Ryze gets uh, some buffs. He hasn't been in pro play for a while, so much like LeBlanc, this is a champion who has traditionally been pro jailed. His solo queue win rates kind of suck. He's not even in pro play. This champ is just bad. So of course we should be able to buff Ryze. Like this to me is just very clean that there shouldn't be anyone who's like, what do you mean? Ryze is already very good. And I'm like, where is your evidence? Because um, basically no one plays him. Nobody wins on him. And even pros don't play him. This champion is just traditionally pro jailed. So we ended up going for some rune prison changes that we um, are hoping to be solo queue, low MMR skewed, we'd be pretty happy if we could get Rise to a 50% solo queue win rate, especially for lower MMR players, um, without, like, breaking what makes Rise Rise, like, without breaking down, um, this champion's, you know, functional gameplay fantasy, but if we can get him to be playable and, like, a normal win rate for a large majority of players, and also just has some pro play, that's a pretty good spot for him to be in, and so we're hoping that, like, oh, I press W, but I don't always empower it, is a slightly low elo skewed thing, and also, oh, I just kind of waste Ws, and I don't, like, you know, cast them, like, really intelligently, is meant to be a low elo skewed thing as well. These are obviously str still strict power in pro play high elo as well, but we hope that they are going to be disproportionately useful in lower MMRs. Uh, we then move on to a big set of Skarner changes. Now, I truly believe right now that Skarner Jungle is already probably OP, and Skarner Top is definitely already OP. But the big thing is that Skarner is kind of hard to play, and so it took time to learn how to play Skarner properly. People are still going to do that. Uh, and then also, our recommended runes and items were pretty bad. Um, we didn't think that Grasp or Aftershock would be particularly good on Skarner. Turns out they're really good on Skarner. Um, now, additionally, much to our surprise, Heartsteel is really good on a jungler because Skarner has really, really high uh, health scalings. Uh, I intentionally gave him high health scalings to make him a jungle tank that scaled strongly with gold, which was a way I thought would let us have a jungle tank that could be successful in solo queue uh, without getting pro jailed. I think gold income is an incredibly strong, uh, gold scaling is incredibly strong pro versus solo queue lover. So again, he has intentionally very strong gold scaling. Um, 
And so anyway, let's talk about what's going on here with this champion, right? So uh, we're updating his recommended rune pages. Uh, so instead of having two phasers pages and a conqueror page, there's an aftershock page, a phasers and conqueror page. Additionally, these pages now also are running um, resolve secondary on their runes and their stat shards are being updated to ability haste, uh, health growth, health growth. I'm 90% sure. Um, instead of like attack speed, attack damage, uh, which just aren't as good as him getting actual tank stats and more ability casts out. So even if you are just using these old rec pages, these old rec pages are going to be stronger uh, because they're running runes that are statistically overperforming compared to what they were running before. Um, the Aftershock page, um, we chose Aftershock because it's it's pretty reliable that you can trigger Aftershock actually. Um, Grasp seems to very clearly statistically overperform against Grasp, um, but the number of times you can get into a spot where the entire enemy team is ranged and you actually just can't stay in range. Um, we said, you know what, we'll just pick the easy option of Aftershock, which is going to be more reliably triggered. Um, though I'm actually pretty sure long-term we should make Aftershock page, Grasp page. And then once we're here, figure out which one's better between Phase Rush and Conqueror, make that the third page, but have an Aftershock page, a Grasp page, and then one of these two as the as the manual recommended pages. And then as time goes on, let, let data sort it out long-term and, and players can further innovate down the line if they want to. But uh, really sure this is valuable as well as the secondaries here. Um, additionally, again, Heart Steel, actually an incredibly good item. Now, what's nice is over the last couple of days, players have um, increasingly understood that Heart Steel is very, very good. Um, they've basically gotten off of Iceborne Gauntlet. This item is actually not very good on him. Uh, so they're going Heart Steel. That's great. Uh, we moved up Dead Man's Plate as the item is also seemingly quite performant. So uh, Dead Man's Plate is going to start showing up around third slot uh, as a recommendation here. And so hopefully we get a lot of win rate gain off of Heart Steel, off of Aftershock, and off of Resolve Secondary and other secondary rune shards that can be useful. So we think this is actually going to be a lot of win rate gain just by this without making him literally a lick more powerful. We think it's going to be a ton of win rate uh, for Skarner because a lot of players are going to start building him more correctly. Uh, next thing up is a reshape to mana. So it is um, functional base mana down, mana regen up, paired with a mana cost increase on W and a mana cost decrease on Q. So we'll do some numbers here. And this is, oh yeah, here's the rise W cooldown. Okay, whatever. Um, this is uh, basically how much Skarner mana is there over the course of four minutes. It's pretty similar. If we did three minutes, it wouldn't be that different either. We could say, you know, times 36, times 36. And it's really just not going to be that different. Here you go. If if it's three minutes of regen, it's identical, right? Um, okay, fine. And then we could say, hey, uh, whatever. Let's let's go back though because we were doing the math this way. Okay, how many W casts can you get over the course of four minutes? Uh, well, because your total mana pool is pretty similar, but your W mana cost went up by ten, you're getting about seventeen to ten percent fewer W casts, uh, which is a pretty big deal, right? you are going to cast this spell um, 10 to you know 15% fewer times in lane. That's a pretty big deal for a spell that is also losing about 16% um, of its damage. So you're losing 60% of its damage and you're losing 10% in your casts. That is a very meaningful output drop. Um, you're going to cast far fewer Ws. You're going to get far less damage out of your W. Uh, we're leaving the AP ratio here for now because uh, I investigated pretty deeply into his builds and it didn't seem like Doran's Ring was actually better than Doran's Shield. It was just that Doran's Ring represented people maxing W. Um, but if you were already maxing W, then Doran's Ring and Doran's Shield were a similar power level. So I didn't bother changing the AP ratio. And it's also why I went for cost more than actually giving him less mana period because you just go Doran's Ring and you get more mana anyway and it breaks down, you know, we shrunk his mana pool, it doesn't really matter. Um, also part of the reason for Drift and Mana Growth is that he is uh, incredibly overperformant um, on um, Fimble Winter. Uh, and Fimble Winter, much like Mana Mune, uh, scales off your base mana as well as your bonus mana, unlike the Seraph's uh, bonus AP, which is only bonus mana. And so by tapping him uh, from mana pool into mana regen, we slightly devalue what you get uh, from uh, Fimble Winter, because that is an item that basically only top Skarner buys, and Jungle Skarner basically doesn't. Um, and again, using mana cost as the actual lever for cast for your Ws, as well as the damage going down for, you know, your Ws being less useful. Um, this will very lightly tap down Fimble Winter. It won't do a ton, but we're hoping that, again, through cost, through damage, and through a little bit this year, that we get some movement on uh, top Skarner win rate. He might need more. Uh, we'll have to see, but that's kind of the hope here to start. Uh, next up, we are doing a whole bunch of QOL and strict buffs to Skarner, because obviously uh, this change in and of itself is a nerf to Jungle Skarner. Uh, this is a win rate positive change to Jungle Skarner, and though I believe that Jungle Skarner is actually OP, um, as of today, his top lane win rate is like 50.8, and his jungle win rate is like 46.7. If you just average all the games together, that's roughly the win rates here. And so uh, we think this will do some, but we still have to close the rest of that 4% win rate gap, and realistically... Um, 
though I think Skarner is actually OP, uh, we have to convince players that he's good, and then we'll tune him correctly. Uh, like, long term, he's probably be nerfing Huey. Uh, I know we're buffing him, you know, down the line. Um, but, like, the guy's got to actually catch on. People have to actually understand how strong he is. And so, uh, in the case of Skarner, we're actually pretty sure he's already too good, but this is happening. Okay, so we're just basically uh, compensating the W cost nerf here so that he doesn't really run out of mana too harshly. Um, mana costs can get a little tight for a Skarner in jungle if you're really hitting your cooldowns well, so we're going a little soft here. Um, this is QOL and almost no win rate. Just that you can hold your rock for a little bit longer. Uh, but this means, though, that, you know, if you're able to time a reset, this goes from a, you know, six-second duration to a nine-second duration uh, in terms of, like, casting a Q early and then holding the rock and then getting your cooldown ticking back up and then getting a second cast really quickly. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, quite a bit nicer here, right? Um, so there is going to be some further optimizations around getting a second Q sooner than do it otherwise because you have more time. But also just because this champion can be slow sometimes and people can get away from you sometimes and you don't always have auto attack access, um, this just helps you keep the buff on so it doesn't time out and force to rock throw okay fine uh next thing is the lockout here the only reason this even exists is that if you double cast q you don't lose the spell um <clears throat> this could have gone shorter to like 0.25 but i basically copied other spells like this and 0.5 appeared to be i literally what i did was i said what does dr Buddha w do that's the lockout timer um, I'm like, what? what's another spell where you could end it early, but you also might want to hold it and we want to make sure you don't double tap? Okay, I'll copy that. Um, not because I love consistency for consistency's sake, because that's not the goal here. It's what has shown to work in League of Legends, 0.5, cool, I'll do that too. It's probably going to work here. Uh, but of course, this has felt slow and sluggish. Uh, so shortening it because it wasn't meant to, this wasn't meant to be like a nerf lever. This was meant to be, let's make sure double tapping doesn't screw you, but let's make sure this is like the appropriate timer that feels okay and feels like I have reason to auto attack. The biggest line is of course this one in terms of feel, which is um, how long uh, this animation locks you into standing in place when you pull the rock out of the ground. Uh, point 0.35 is the rock has clearly left the ground now and now you can go. Um, and this is pretty much the minimum we can put the spell cast before you start really glitching the animation. Um, and so this is basically the best compromise we can get between art quality and gameplay quality. Um, and we hope this is going to make him feel a lot nicer and a lot smoother to play. Um, getting 0.50 seconds back on a spell cast is a really big deal. Uh, this can be a lot of power. We use this lever on Rel in her mid scope. And to be fair, Cast time on Q is literally, can they dodge my stun or not? It's not the same thing here. It's not going to be nearly as powerful, but it did a lot for Field of Champion and as well for win rate in her case. Um, so we'll see what happens, but uh, yeah, that's here. And then the actual like second meaningfully gameplay impact, game impact and change, because theoretically this is like a little bit of power down for Skarner Jungle. This is neutral. This is power up. This is neutral, but feels. This is neutral, but feels. This doesn't really matter because this was here. Um, so we're like probably, you know, neutral to negative win rate in terms of just actual power here. Uh, we're going to donate some power to Skarner, um, which is basically taking the 0 to 30 damage off of W and add it as 0 to 20 per hit on Q. Now keep in mind, 0 to 20 per hit physical damage is worth worse, um, at least per hit, um, than magic damage because every champ has more armor than MR. So even though the numbers might look better, this is 60 damage theoretically. It's 60 damage in a small AoE versus 30 damage in a large AoE. Uh, and magic damage, which means it's still probably even that much better. Uh, but trying to make sure that Q is where Skarner's damage comes from, make him have to stay in melee range, and make that be part of the combat tension. Um, so it is both a base damage increase of 0 to 20, as well as a hefty bonus AD increase, uh, bonus AD ratio increase, because we do actually want Juggernaut Skarner to be an equally viable build. Titanic, Hydra, Sundered Sky, Shojin, Steric, Gauge, those kinds of items, I think are reasonable to let him buy. Uh, so let's do the math here on the damage, okay? Uh, so this is uh, full tank Skarner. This is basically assuming you get um, 0 to 2,000 bonus HP via items and such, and using the double scaling health stat shards that are going to be default uh, I just use them for both pages. I'm not like switching two stat shards in one page versus the other. I'm just saying you have double stat shards. Also, if you get another 2,000 health somewhere else, this is what's happening. And so this is the damage, the bonus damage per hit of Q before and after. Um, this is, again, pretty close to full build. This is a lot of items, a lot of bonus HP. This is overgrowth, everything else going on here. Um, it's, of course, quite a bit. But the, you know... 20 damage per hit comes in right here, and yeah, it's a lot of damage, right? Uh, we go on to the other side, which is, okay, well, what if you're going to go for a Juggernaut build? You're going to build Titanic, you're going to build Sterics, whatever. And we said, okay, well, let's say you get up to 1,500 bonus health, but you're also going to get 200 bonus AD here. I don't know if that's the exact right trade, uh, but I picked arbitrary numbers and said, if you build this way instead, what's the difference between the patch? Again, you still get your, you know, 20 base damage here, but... Um, 
because the AD ratio has 1.5x, you're getting up to 25% more damage off of your AD scaling, which means you're getting a solid, you know, really meaningful jump here of 60 damage per hit instead of 20 damage per hit if you're going to build um, a solid amount of AD on Skarner. Um, I don't know if this will be the exact right amount of power, such that Sterex and Titanic are viable alternate builds in this champion, but that is the hope here. Um, if it ends up, this like really skews him toward top lane, whatever, uh, that's going to be kind of weird. Ultimately, there is clearly a market for top lane Skarner players. That's great. Um, I am happy to try to tune him across both those roles. I don't think it'll be extremely difficult. Um, I assume the levers will be there if we need to do minion mods or monster mods or something. This is possible. Uh, some kind of refund. I don't know. We can figure it out. There's ways to make this work correctly. Um, even if it has to do, you know, the, the, you know, vague inelegance of monster mods, it's fine. Um, but there's clearly a player base for both these roles. Let's try to make Jungle Skarner look good and feel good to play and perform well. Let's make sure Top Skarner isn't OP. And then when those are in the right spot, let's, you know, serve the player base wherever they are, right? Having viable top tanks is a good thing. Tanks are good for League of Legends. And there aren't a lot of ones that are fun to play and viable. So I'm happy that there are some, right? Alrighty. Moving on, we are doing a follow-up on Silas Jungle. He's probably still going to be quite on the low side. I would guess he's topping out at 48% win rate. I think that is fine. I think that is kind of the low end of acceptable win rates for Silas. I think he should be, you know, 48 to, you know, just sub 49. Um, so 48x is a pretty reasonable Silas win rate. Hopefully he gets to around there with the chain uh, lash monster damage. That's the hope here, though. Thresh is um, honestly not terribly weak, but... Um, realistically, this is just going for spice. This is the MSI patch. He doesn't, again, ultra need the buffs. He can stomach a little bit here. Uh, we're going for about 1% winner. We're not going to do that much here to Thresh. Uh, but it's two base armor to make him play the front line a bit better. It's a bit of MR growth to match him with other mid-range champions. Uh, Lilia and Rumble have as much MR, for example. And I really like embracing middle ground stat lines. Um... I just think that's really valuable, personally. Uh, and so, you know, here you go. You're a mid-range champion. You have mid-range champion MR. Let's let's make that a thing that we actually have and use and do. I think it's a cool thing instead of, you know, I think we can do more of. Uh, but regardless, here, Thresh, you're a slightly better frontliner. Have fun. When you are the only melee on your team, melee on your team. As Thresh, you're a little better at that job. Okay, great. How much to say here? It's a little bit of power. Uh, Zach is obviously a pretty oppressive top laner. Um, we elected to go for pretty low scope changes here. Uh, ultimately, I know that Zach's trading pattern in top lane can feel really abusive. I know his overall healing can be pretty abusive. I know his overall late game damage can feel really abusive. Keep in mind, though, all of that is predicated on his early landing phase being extremely, extremely, extremely strong. If Zach comes out of every landing phase ahead in gold because he's unassailable and, you know, forces you to die, and he can never be forced to recall, and he never loses turret plates, and he never, he never X, Y, and Z, then he's always ahead on XP, he's always ahead on gold, and he's always the biggest top player in the game, the biggest champion in the game, committed team fights. Lo and behold, wow, we can't handle his healing. Yeah, because he's two levels up on everyone, because he never had to recall, you know, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Like, this can snowball really aggressively. And so I agree that Zach top lane is currently overpowered. Um, I don't think every single aspect of Zach's kit needs to be hit with a dump truck, because he's like... 52-ish percent win rate, roughly, around there, right? And it's like, okay, he's, you know, too strong, but he's not, like, extremely too strong. He's just too strong. Um, and so try to swing pretty hard on the safety of his early lane. I don't think Zach should feel like, ah, oh, yeah, Zach, the champ who's unassailable in lane. I don't think that's what should feel correct about him. And this guy has a ton of regen via his passive, right? His passive is health positive uh, because you pick up blobs. And if it's not, you're doing a better job picking up blobs. And so saying, well, you have a health regen positive passive, you don't need high base health regen. And so we're going from him having one of the higher health regens in the game to having one of the lower health regens in the game. And this could go lower, but we thought win rate magnitude wise that this was appropriate. Now it could be that this lever means very, very little and that we have to go even harder here. We can bring him down to like Soraka, Ari, or uh, Warwick levels. And that, you know, we drop his HP five by three and it's 1% win rate. And we can do it again and drop another 1% win rate. That's fine. We can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, it also might be that this does literally nothing and we have to go for blobs. That's fine. We can do that too. Or we go for his late game damage or something. We can also do that. Th those are all reasonable things that we can totally choose to do. And that's not a problem at all. Um, He's just acknowledging that uh, this champion is pretty fair as a jungler, but is clearly an unassailable laner in top lane. And so base health regen is a really, really good lever for skewing toward the unassailability of his early top lane. Um, we have some math. It's pretty fake. This is the base health regen um, per minute for Zach before and after. It is meaningfully cut down by, you know, 30% or so in the early laning phase. Um, this is... 
uh, assuming he arbitrarily picks up 10 blobs every minute like clockwork, uh, how much health regen that would be before factoring in items of any regard. Uh, it's kind of fake. It's whatever. It's just there as a vague jumping off point for what happens to his real regen if he actually picks up that many blobs. Um, that's probably not going to be really true in the early game. It's probably going to be more true in the late game when he has lower cooldowns and can just kind of spam W on a wave, but whatever. The final individual champion nerf is to Zeri, who is losing 30 base health. Um, early pro data from 14.6 showed that she was the go-to marksman. And we didn't want the uh, MSI meta to be determined solely by uh, better crit ADC wins. And so through an abundance of caution, uh, tapped down the elite skewed, pro skewed Zeri. Uh, her win rates are still pretty reasonable for how hard she is to play. Uh, this is a champion who's probably supposed to be sub 50 win rate because she's harder than most other marksmen. And so if you're going to, you know, expect that required mastery curves have an impact on win rate, spoilers, they do. Uh, Zeri is balanced at a sub 50 win rate. And so tapping Zeri down here because we thought it was the right choice, both for solo queue and for pro play. Uh, Jinx, to be clear, is probably a little bit overpowered as well. Um, we wanted to give a little more time for the static shift nerfs to kick in and see how people felt about them. Uh, but ultimately, Jinx almost certainly has to be next up as well. She is currently the most picked champion in League of Legends. The ban rate is growing, probably has to happen, but that'll be for next patch. Anyway, move on to some systems changes. So we are buffing the attacks, I guess you could say the alternate attacks of Baron Nasher. Uh, so the acid pull damage goes from 10% total AD to 200 plus 10% total AD. Uh, the pull damage goes from 75 to 300. Uh, the hunting Baron uh, lightning does about one third more damage. 20% current health is of course quite a bit. Uh, the acid shot going from 20% to 200 from 50%, obviously a pretty big jump there. And the knockout going from 25% to 200 plus 25%. Uh, so I want you to guess, um, as a percentage, how much more damage are these buffs? Obviously, this is 33% and this is 4x. Um, but like, how much percentage-wise more damage is this, is this, and is this? Um, just, you know, back your net, you know, back your head, what's the numbers? Uh, it's a lot. Uh, so for reference, Baron's base attack damage is 350 to 520. So if he just spits on you, and by the way, I think it's like every third auto attack, he casts a spell. So no matter what these numbers are, three quarters of output is just attacking you three times and then it's doing one of these buttons right um so the acid pool goes from doing basically no damage at all to doing a lot of damage is less than auto attack now of course it's aoe so it's obviously quite a bit nicer but yeah the pool is doing like five to six times as much damage and to be clear um this is the only amount of ad you could ever have uh he spawns at 20 minutes and his ad stops growing at, at minute 37 so this is just the sum total of the numbers you could possibly have here for baron um and it's between these two things. Most games, of course, end by 37. Uh, most games see Baron by 20 minutes as well. So this is, you know, a pretty inclusive count of what's going on here. Um, the pull, of course, 4x damage, not a surprise here, gets nerfed or gets buffed by a little bit less than this got buffed by. Okay. Um, again, his base AD, 350 to 520. The acid shot goes up massively. Again, 4 to 5x damage. Uh, yeah, very big bump here. It's doing almost as much as his base AD is in the first place. Pretty big deal. Um, and then the tentacle knock up in case you don't dodge it. Uh, a pretty meaningful bump up here as well. Of course, this is dodgeable. Keep in mind for a lot of these things, the the uh, ability is dodgeable. The pull is dodgeable. The knock up is dodgeable. The acid pools you can get off of, um, you know, they're functionally dodgeable um, as well. So, you know, if you're paying attention, if you're a good League of Legends player, you can, you know, dodge away from this pretty reliably. I am, however, expecting, especially in Lore of Mars, the Baron will start killing a lot more champions and that low MR games will actually go um, measurably longer. I'm going to just ballpark that the average low MMR game goes 30 seconds longer because Baron will just randomly shut down a team. That is my guess. We'll see if I'm right. We'll see if I'm wrong. Um, anyway, I think that'll be a thing that happens. And again, clearly these attacks are going to be very powerful, but again, his literal auto attacks are already doing, you know, three to 500. And this is about the ballpark, what these special attacks are doing. So it's not anything out of the line. It's just, oh, these are roughly in line with how this is supposed to work in the first place, probably, right? So cool changes here. I think very, very smart. Um, but again, it's roughly one quarter of his attacks are these. Uh, and now they're doing as much instead of way, way, way less than his regular attacks were already doing. Um, so, you know, we bumped one quarter of his damage by 5x. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the other change, though, which I'm very happy that we're doing is uh, meaningful buffs and uh, timing changes to Void Grubs. Uh, so the first one is they are being decoupled, which means that uh, if you are getting turbo stomped in lane and your team goes for uh, the six minute Grubs, you can gatekeep the enemy top or mid laner from being level six for this. If you beat them hard enough, you will have your ulti and your opponent won't when you fight for Grubs. In more reliable cases, if you're fighting for six minute Grubs, 615 Grubs, 630 Grubs, 
the solos will be six and the jugglers will not be, which means top laners and mid laners have much more of a say around how the first round of grubs goes. That's a pretty big deal. Also keep in mind that grubs durability uh, scales pretty sharply with game time. Uh, so this is actually a, a significantly tankier camp as a result because it's one minute later, which is a meaningful increase in health overall. So it's also going to be much harder to sneak as a jungler in the first place, which means, again, agency to the top and mid laner, they have a much more of a say over who takes scrubs. I think it's a good thing. Not only do they have much more of a say over who takes scrubs, but the value is going up very substantially. It's going up by a third. Uh, the baseline value of Void Grubs outside of the Golden XP rewards is one-third more valuable. That is a lot. That is buffing the objective by 33%, which is a very, very big deal, which means, yeah, your ability to knock down some turrets if you're the Void Grub team gets a lot, a lot, a lot nicer. This is definitely a big deal. Uh, additionally, if you are able to get four stacks, aka your opponents only get one Grub per spawn, you still spawn a Void Mite, which means you can use it to take a turret shot, apply the passive for you for whatever reason, all this kind of stuff. It's just some power. These aren't incredibly powerful as far as I can tell, um, but they have an impact. We're going a little bit light by doing mostly this buff instead of like buffing the output of each Void Mite, uh, but it does do something. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, a obviously very, very large buff to what Void is actually doing. Uh, the fact that you get a summon at only four, aka your opponents only steal one from each spawn, pretty big deal as well. Um, and not only are the souls going to be level six for this most of the time, but also going to be decoupled from the dragon spawn. So you can theoretically get to a state where um, your team chooses to play for bottom side because of a recall timing or whatever. You get the dragon at 5.15, 5.30. And even if your jungle has to reset or your support doesn't roam up or whatever, it's like, yeah, but like our deck is level six and is stronger than you. So your enemy jungler can't just go trade map because... My is going to be coming from base at full health, at full mana, and my Renekton is just stronger than your top laner and is going to say, no, you can't do this and bully you off the objective. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more likely as well. And so the hope here is that the decoupling not only says the better team gets all the objectives instead of the better team gets one and the other team just trades it for free uh, because 3v2s are obviously like pretty free to win, especially if the enemy top laner, especially the souls are five, uh, to no, you can't reliably easily trade this. Um, and also the soul is going to have a big say here. So I think this is pretty meaningful. I feel like I'm overstating a little bit, but like not by that much. I think it is a pretty big deal. So that's pretty much the rundown. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoy the patch. Hope you enjoy MSI. See you next time.